Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity uh, to um, share some of the work that we've been doing uh, with uh, the rest of the Galaxy team um, and other collaborators all over the world. The um, presentation uh, that I'm going to uh, deliver today is also available for you as a PDF document. There's a link in the top right corner of the screen. Um, so you're free to uh, you know, download it, follow along, or uh, review it later. Uh, the, um, this is an evolving um, epidemic or pandemic. And obviously, as we collect more data, our understanding of the evolution of the virus will uh, improve. And um, this presentation, the static shot of what we know of uh, uh, as of early this week, but if you want to go and uh, review what's available at any particular moment in time as we move forward, um, you should um, also take note of the uh, covid19.galaxyproject.org URL, which is the uh, hub for everything that uh, the seminar series has been talking about. All right, without further ado, um, oops, sorry. I, I clicked on the wrong button. There we go. All right. So um, back in February, uh, these folks published uh, a prescient paper uh, with the title, We Shouldn't Worry When a Virus Mutates During Disease Outbreak. Uh, and the uh, take home message from that uh, actually really nice um, uh, overview is uh, that mutations are a natural part of the virus cycle and rarely impact outbreaks dramatically. Um, however, if you look at uh, the way uh, the virus is covered in popular press, you get a very different picture where uh, every preprint that can be interpreted uh, to state that the virus is becoming more dangerous, more contagious, uh, uh, substantially change its ability to cause disease, coronavirus's ability to mutate has been vastly underestimated, and mutations affect deadliness of strains, you get an entirely different picture. Obviously, that's quite biased, but you know there's a big disconnect between these two views. Um, so just to lay down some terms, uh, the primary focus of um, our work has been to uh, try to investigate the extent uh, and impact that natural selection might have uh, on the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Uh, mutation, which occurs um, in all RNA viruses, perhaps a little slower in coronaviruses than others. Recombination, which is rampant, uh, at least in animal hosts and coronaviruses. In fact, SARS-CoV-2 um, has evidence of recombinant origins, although when it happened, it's not entirely clear. And you have other processes. In this particular case, you might have RNA editing, um, will introduce variation into genomes of organisms. You know, this variation on its own doesn't mean anything. You have to uh, uh, combine it uh, with a fitness um, of an organism. So a particular mutation might um, confer advantages or disadvantages to the virus. And this is usually measured in something uh, uh, that relates to fitness, which is actually difficult to quantify. The fitness of a virus is actually, you know, fairly nebulous concept. But roughly speaking, the ability to survive, grow, function, replicate, transmit, um, and pass on a genetic material to future generations, any particular mutation can be one of three broad categories. Uh, the vast majority of genetic variation should fall into the neutral class, which means that these mutations have no or little effect in fitness. Um, you can have deleterious mutations, which reduce fitness, uh, adaptive mutations, which uh, increase fitness, and the important um, caveat is that the same exact mutation can have different fitness costs in different environments and different genetic backgrounds. So a classic example would be a drug resistance mutation, say in HIV or something like this, that obviously is beneficial um, if the drug is present in a particular host, but deleterious generally if it isn't. What does selection in viruses look like? And we don't get to observe it um, unless we're running uh, experimental evolution experiments, so we have to infer it based on typically sequence analysis. Um, before we undertake this analysis, we need to conduct a thought experiment, which is, are there necessary conditions 
uh, that are required in order for natural selection to operate. Um, so necessary conditions, there are many you can uh, propose, but the two that I think are most important is that obviously you need to have some selective pressure on the virus. There's no selective pressure. Um, if, if it's perfectly uh, happy to replicate in its current state, that's probably what it's gonna do. The selective pressure on the virus can come from a variety of sources. It can be exerted by the immune system or different arms of the immune system. It uh, can be exerted by drugs, uh, other host factors, antiviral defense mechanisms, for example, or you know the, uh, the development of tropism for different cell types. And you need to have enough time in order for this selective pressure to resolve and translate into sequence variation, which we can observe and study. And we should um, then now think to stop is have we had those two necessary conditions in SARS-CoV-2? There is no clear evidence so far of selective pressure, which is not unexpected. So this virus, um, we don't have as a population of host pre-existing immunity uh, to coronaviruses of this type. So it doesn't see a whole lot of um, strong selective uh, pressure from the immune system. We aren't deploying drugs uh, broadly enough uh, to make a difference. And other host factors we can speculate about, but generally they will not have such a strong effect as immune or drug selection uh, at, at this stage of the infection. So there might be, but it's not entirely obvious what it is. I mean, we expect there to be some selective pressure, but we don't have uh, a smoking gun, so to speak. And we had about six months uh, of SARS-CoV-2 evolution if you um, take the estimate that it started spreading the human population sometime uh, in November 2019. To detect selection from sequences, uh, we also need certain conditions. So we need to collect sufficiently many sequences. Uh, that on its own is not enough because if I give you thousands of sequences that are exactly identical, your inference would be that nothing's happening and that would be the sensible inference. So these sequences also need to be different from each other. So it needs to be some genetic divergence from the founder and diversity. And then it doesn't, uh, it's not enough just to have some mutations, you need to have a particular type of mutation. So you can have sort of two broad categories that look quite different, but um, they, they both uh, are uh, indications of selection. So you can have repeated substitutions um, at a particular location in the genome, uh, sometimes to different residues, uh, which means that uh, the selection is working to change or just create a lot of variance at that particular site. You can have a change in frequency, like in a selective suite. Uh, directional. So just to give you some examples, here's a um, tree that depicts um, at a very broad scale 40 years of uh, hemagglutinin evolution uh, of H3N2 influenza. Um, so this is about 40 years in time and notice the scale at the top so that uh, this is about 15% nucleotide divergence root to tip, well 10%. Um, and uh, what I've highlighted in this tree are uh, a particular, particular site in hemagglutinin where a lot of changes occur. So the, branch, the branches that are shown in dark, thick lines are repeated substitutions that occur at this site over time. Uh, so that type of um, evolution, and these amino acid substitutions, will uh, be indicative of selective pressure uh, working to modify the composition of this site. You could also look um, at a different site in the same genome displayed differently. Now you have a different type of evolution where uh, you started out with a D at this residue closer to the root in ancestral states, and then at some point it switched to an N, and that basically became fixed in the population. So this is rare. This is, re you know, less frequent than diversifying selection and complete fixation in viruses occurs, but, you know, it's less frequent. So that's a different type of mutation where you have a different type of selection. Where you have one substitution that is then maintained, so that's directional selection. So we can think about looking for patterns like this in SARS-CoV-2 sequences. So... Um, remember, I had four categories, you know, that we need to have in order to detect selection. So the first one is sufficiently many sequences, and that we have in spades for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so at the bottom of this page, there's a link to a live notebook and observable that's developed by Stephen Weaver um, uh, in, in, in our group uh, that uh, does a live tracking of the number of sequences that are available um, in GISAID, uh, which is a, a genomic database that was originally developed for um, Influenza surveillance and now has gained prominence as the repository for um, SARS-CoV-2 assembled genomes. So figure one in the top left, you can see that the number of sequences deposited in this uh, database is growing exponentially. 
So it started very slow in February, and now it's up to over 25,000 sequences. So there's almost 30,000 sequences now. If you look at figure 2A, which is at the bottom, you will see the different countries contribute different numbers of sequences. The country with the most sequences uh, deposited is United Kingdom, followed by the United States, followed by Australia, and everybody else is further down at the bottom. And figure 3B shows the sort of rate of sequencing, where you have the number of confirmed cases per country versus the number of sequences. So you can see the United States is kind of keeping track, more or less linearly, whereas the UK is really killing it. I mean, they have a remarkable effort to sequence and deposit their databases, and everybody else is um, uh, not doing um, nearly as well. But they also have fewer cases. So uh, these that's a lot of data. Um, I mean, 30,000 uh, whole genomes. So you know, the first thing you can do is you can look at them in a very simple um, sort of one number summary. Um, and what's shown here is exactly that. Let me walk you through this um, chart. So we have on the x-axis is um, the week of collection. So you know, sequences started being collected in late December, and now we're, you know, uh, there's a little bit of lag in deposition, so we're almost to the uh, end of April. The time is quantized into weeks in this plot. And on the y-axis, you have a distance from the December Wuhan isolate. So that's basically how far is an average circulating sequence at a particular time point uh, from the ancestral strain for the reference. It's not necessarily in the ancestral strain, but that's a reference genome. So we'll take it as a proxy for the ancestral strain. Uh, the thick line in the middle, the pinkish one, is the world average. And then all the squiggly lines are individual countries. So it just shows you there's a lot of variation that has to do with sampling. But overall, there's not a whole lot of going on. And if you look at the scale, it's minuscule. It's two one hundredth of a percent, which means that on average, a genome that was isolated at the end of uh, April is only seven nucleotides different uh, from the reference genome. So it's not very much at all. Uh, another way to look at it is not um, it's the same type of plot, the y-axis changed. So what I'm looking for now is contemporaneous diversity, which is if I take a sequence that's circulating today and pick another random sequence that's also circulating today, how different are they from each other? So uh, that's uh, basically a snapshot of uh, genetic diversity uh, today. So this might be more relevant for things like vaccine design considerations, because you know you want to look at contemporaneous strain. And it's a very similar picture. So it's a little higher, so you know, up to 0.03%, 0 .03%, but it still is only nine genome-wide um, pairwise differences in contemporaneous strains. Now, keep that in mind next time you read um, you know, some sensational headline about multiple strains of SARS-CoV-2. Um, people smarter than me have said many times now that there's only one strain. And the reason there's only one strain at the moment is because there's not enough differences between the strains to make a meaningful distinction. Typically, in order to, um, well, we, I'm not going to digress, but this is basically a, a very, very homogeneous viral population. Now, I'm going to look at it very differently and tell you an entirely different story. So this is from the standpoint of genome-wide metrics. Now, let's actually look at site-by-site uh, -site information in this genome. So if you basically, uh, instead of focusing on difference between two genes, look at a particular site in the genome and tabulate all the variants that you've observed in these thousands upon thousands of genes, you will see a very different picture. There is extensive apparent genome variation at the population level. So what's shown here is a fairly busy plot, but you're not expected to look at it in too much detail just to see that a lot of the sites are tagged by some type of variation. So this is one gene. Uh, in SARS-CoV-2, this is the spike protein, uh, the gene that codes for the spike protein, which is, you know, what people are uh, mostly looking at in terms of uh, adaptive change, because that's, you know, what's exposed and targeted by the immune system. And if you look at the different bands, so like genome track, uh, you know, at the top you have nucleotide differences, which basically means there's at least one sequence with at least one nucleotide change at that position. The nucleotide two times, which means two sequences share the position, amino acid changes, amino acid times two and you know a lot of other things so there's a lot of variation at individual positions um, you can also plot it over time um, and um, let me walk you through these plots on the left plot you also have temporal um, a time series plot where you have analysis date in this case it's not the time th this is not when sequences are isolated but we, we've been running this analysis basically every day for the last you know close to I guess eight weeks now 
So this is a summary of what happens when you uh, run these analyses and, and tabulate the results. On the y-axis in the left plot is the fraction of sites with any variation. You know, zero meaning everything is constant, one, one meaning every site is variable, and individual lines are specific genes or ORFs in a protein. So you will see it on the, during our first analysis, there already was a fair bit of variation, somewhere from 10 to 25% of physicians had at least one nucleotide variant. By now, it's basically uh, uh, a majority of physicians uh, have a variant, right? So um, like in um, uh, OR3A, 90% uh, of physicians have at least one nucleotide variant. Uh, you might say, you know, a lot of this is sequencing noise, and you'd, you'd probably be correct, or just mutations that don't make any difference. So let's make it stricter and look at the fraction of sites that have amino acid variants that are shared by at least two sequences. Uh, so all the lines get shifted down, but the trend is still there. Things are increasing quite dramatically. So, you know, in the latest analysis, you go anywhere from 10% of physicians to 35% of physicians in a particular gene having shared amino acid variants. So the virus is generating a lot of variability at the genomic level, yet at between individual genes, there's not a whole lot of differences. And part of the reason for it is that most variants are rare. Um, so if you look at um, the histograms binned by uh, whether or not uh, amino acid variants occur at less than 1% frequency or greater than 1% frequency, the first thing you will notice that the vast majority, so something like you know almost 3,000 variants occur exactly once, uh, then about 600 variants occur twice, and so on. And if you look at the variants that occur, uh, say, more than 50% uh, of the time, there are only three of them. So there are only three positions in the entire genome where something changed in the population uh, since the ancestral um, sequence was uh, derived. Um, and you can say that you know a lot of these variants are probably sequencing error. Uh, some of them might be due to RNA editing. Uh, the majority of the variants that are not errors or uh, biological noise are neutrally, neutral or slightly deleterious intra-host variants. And the minority, but the important minority, are the important variants. So let me give you um, an overview in three slides of basically what my lab has been doing for the last 20 years, which is developing uh, various techniques uh, for uh, finding evidence of selection from comparative sequences. And the intuition is really, really simple. Uh, so you look at the data, uh, you look at the nucleotide data, uh, and you see whether or not nucleotide changes translate into amino acid changes at the very first crude level of approximation. So here's one extreme example uh, where nucleotide changes that are quite dramatic between three different viruses, measles, rinderpest, and peste petite, result in exactly the same amino acids. So this, this particular part of this particular protein is under incredibly strong selection to maintain the same amino acids. Contrast this to uh, an antigenic site in influenza hemagglutinin where basically the opposite is true. Almost every single nucleotide change that you see results in amino acid changes. So these are the two extremes. We can quantify them very simply using these quantities called DN and DS. Um, these are not new, these are about 50 years old. And in the first iteration, you might have seen them called KAKS, depending on your uh, background. Uh, you might have seen the ratio referred to as omega. But the fundamental intuition is, um, again, this is all very, very high level, simple approximations. If you have questions about technical details, I'll be happy to address them later on. Uh, but um, because synonymous substitutions do not alter the protein, we often assume that they are effectively neutral. We can estimate the rate at which these synonymous substitutions accumulate, and that rate serves as a neutral background evolutionary rate. Then we can estimate the rate of accumulation of non-synonymous substitutions, which do alter the protein sequence, normalize it by DS, and use the ratio to quantify the nature of the evolutionary process. So roughly speaking, DS, you know, in the first methods, that's really what they did. They looked at the number of fixed synonymous mutations and normalized by the proportion of random mutations that are expected to be synonymous. And DN is the same thing for non-synonymous mutations. If the ratio is about one, evolution is neutral. If DN is greater than DS, you have positive selection. So there's promotion. There, uh, amino acid changes are promoted relative to neutral expectation. And if DN is less than DS, then they're suppressed relative to the neutral expectation. So you have negative selection. Um, so as I mentioned over uh, 
the last 15 years, my lab and collaborators have been developing a collection of methods for estimating DNDS and interpreting them as evidence for selection. These methods are implemented in the HiFi software package and also available in Galaxy. So the, uh, all the tools here on the right, I took a snapshot of uh, what happens if you search for HiFi and um, uh, use Galaxy main instance. So there are all these um, various tools for uh, looking for different types of selection. We also have a web server, a standalone web server called DataMonkey. One of the interesting things is that uh, we, we realized, and we've done some um, sort of uh, uh, data analytics behind the scenes to see uh, at what point and at what rate have people been using our tools to study SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this is again due to uh, Stephen Weaver. He um, generated a plot where you have temporal, um, uh, where you have time on the x-axis and the proportion of all the jobs that went to DataMonkey and their primarily selection or combination analyses. And you see, you know, nobody was interested in coronaviruses in January. And then, um, you know, progressively more and more up to 10% of all the analyses that go to uh, this web server, which is just a generic molecular evolution server, are related to SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, um, that the standard DNDS, and DNDS analysis, uh, which are quite powerful in a lot of um, applications, will not necessarily work particularly well at the moment. And I'll try to give you um, a couple of uh, sort of uh, uh, points uh, to provide intuition for it is the first one is that if you're not careful and you just do a sort of standard analyses, a lot of the signal will come from uh, variation uh, in individual sequences. And if you think back to the slide where I showed you, where basically almost every position has a hit, that's going to drive your signal um, up, but that's influenced by sequencing noise and dead end variation. So one of the tricks we can use is if you look at the evolutionary tree, which you have to do in order for these analyses to run, you basically only look at internal branches. You don't look at the leaves. You kind of reduce the, uh, uh, and the reason for this is an internal branch represents at least one round of successful viral replication and transmission. Um, and the other thing is because you have very, very little divergence in diversity, uh, every statistical method in order to de derive power and do something needs to basically have a sufficient uh, sample size. It's difficult to estimate what the sample size for these types of methods is. It doesn't have a nice intuitive interpretation. But one of the things you can think about is the total depth of the tree, right? So if sequences are identical, you should have no power to detect anything. So the branch length is zero. And as you increase sequence diversity, you sort of accumulate more and more substitutions. And these uh, provide the substrate in which these methods can operate. So in SARS-CoV-2 data, the trees are very, very shallow. If you looked at any of the publications, if they show the scale, a lot of the branches have exactly one substitution on them. In fact, if you take um, uh, across the entire sequence, um, so you have um, over 15,000 sequences. If you sum up all the branch lengths across these very trees with many, many sequences, it's actually very short. It's only 0.1 substitution across the entire tree per site. So what you're actually trying to do, you're basically trying, you know, in, in, in rough statistical terms, you're trying to estimate, say, the probability that a coin is fair or biased for maybe three or four coin tosses. So you can't do it very well. Right, you need a bigger sample size. Um, so the charts on the right show you that as we collect more data, the total branch length increases. So it started out actually very, very, very short, like 0.001 in, in May, and ended up basically increased by a factor of 10 because we've collected more sequences. But that still doesn't get you very far. So the bottom of uh, the chart on the right is kind of, a, it's a power plot if you've ever seen this, which is, you know, as you increase the strength of selection, the x-axis, what's unsimulated data, how often do you expect this method to tell you that sites are positively selected? And it's very, very weak. So the dotted line is basically uh, no noise. So as, if you don't cross, if you're below this line, your method has no power, and you have to basically make very, very strong selection. Uh, uh, it takes very, very strong selection to barely cross this line. So, and these are very, very sensitive methods. So I, I'm not aware of the ones that can do better than, than, than the ones that we're applying. I could be wrong, but it's, it's not obvious. Uh, so at this point, it is very, very difficult to reliably infer selection based only on sequence comparison, because even if it's there, and if we're somehow able to pull it out from the noise, the power to detect sites under selection is quite, quite low. Uh, all right, so what are the alternatives? If you look at the literature, they're basically, um, people are looking at the same data and I've sort of come up with this idea that's kind of like staring at the Rorschach plot. You know, people look at the same sequences and they see what they want to see. 
Um, so there's one approach to say there's nothing happening, so let's just give up and wait until something more obvious happens. The other one is go back to the 1980s and say, oh, there's a mutation. It must mean something. And then it gets published in some gullible uh, uh, publication that says, oh, look, the virus is becoming more pathogenic. Um, I don't think either one of those is necessarily, those are two extremes, and I don't advocate for extremes. So, you know, I'm, I'm a centrist kind of guy. Uh, so let's um, try to use maybe something more than just sequence variation to uh, try to refine our understanding of selection. And some of the other sources already presented in this uh, seminar series, and one of the big sources is intra-host variation, right? So what happens within deep sequencing data sets is informative about the type of changes that the virus is making within a specific host. We can also look, um, so this is kind of a smaller, a more refined scale. You can also zoom out and you can say, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus. Beta coronaviruses are very old viruses. I mean, they've been around in animal hosts for probably, you know, millions of years. So let's look what happened in other beta coronaviruses. That's um, your standard homology approach. You know, nothing's new under the sun. So if a mutation occurred in previous beta coronaviruses and occurs in SARS-CoV-2, it might tell you something about it. We also have meta data. We have temporal and functional annotation data that might help us uh, gain power. Um, so uh, this is the current, um, if you go to our uh, sort of uh, landing page, we're migrating it to Galaxy and it will occur uh, as soon as we can make it, uh, uh, you know, robust and reliable. But at the moment, this this lives in a in an observable notebook, which pulls data from uh, uh, recent analyses and aggregates them into some visual plots for you. And and the link is at the bottom. It's also available through uh, COVID19.galaxyproject.org. So here's a snapshot of the current quote-unquote selective state of SARS-CoV-2. And I'll um, uh, I'll walk through um individual categories in, uh, in the next couple of slides, so don't worry about it too much. So there's a smattering of sites that are different categories we're looking at. And you can see that if you take sort of the most permissive view of any category um, contributes site to selection, there's actually a fair bit of sites, about 200, that shows something in the entire genome. They're not distributed evenly across the genome, uh, which you can see in the bottom plot. But uh, in order to simplify this, uh, uh, we basically come up with a very simple score where each of those categories that's shown on the left, selection, multiple place, like an animal, so on, can give one point to a site. Sum them all up, it gives you a total uh, score of the site. If you filter on sites that have six or more points, that's a much cleaner picture. There's 11 high priority sites. You can see that most of them live in ORF 1A, which is also the longest ORF. There are a couple that live in what I call ORF 1B, which is non-canonical, but it's basically whatever happens, uh, the, the, the part of the protein that occurs after the slippage site. There's nothing in spike um, that, that, that hits this. There's some in ORF 3A, and there's, uh, there, um, that's it. There's actually nothing else. So um, let me uh, walk you through a couple of screenshots and try to, uh, which, which is what you would see if you go to this observable notebook. And you're, um, I encourage you to go and you know, play with it. This is the top site uh, that, that, that has the most, uh, um, uh, has a score of eight. So every single category that we uh, uh, use, this site ticks. And this is a site in RDRP 323, so uh, RNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase. Uh, we first detected this on our first analysis. So it first uh, was detected in uh, March 20 on March 25th, and it's still there. And um, let me explain what the categories are. So um, the plus sign simply means that the DNDS analyses, um, you know, this two particular methods we use are called FEL or MEME on internal branches uh, provide a statistically significant result of selection there. So that's uh, category one. Um, if you recall what I just told you, this by itself probably should not be taken as uh, particularly strong evidence that this site is important because you know statistical error and uh, uh, just you know lack of power as well. So let's look at others. So the next thing we're asking for is if you look at the evolutionary tree, uh, does this particular change uh, which would be, um, you know, um, uh, P to L. Um, P was the ancestral state and L is the derived state, you will see in the next. It occurs more than once. So I've highlighted the arrows uh, that show you where you know, green changes to purple. What this means, if you believe this tree, and again, notice the scale of this tree. All of these branches are tiny. So this literally, a branch means one substitution. So it's a very, very shallow tree. But nonetheless, we see multiple events when this particular substitution occurs which means that if you take it at face value and you could 
uh, you know, sort of a, a, in a qualitative sense, this is not just something that happened once. Because once you can say it occurred by chance or uh, introduction and, and boundary effect, if it occurred more than once, uh, it, it might indicate repeated substitutions, for example, or repeated introductions. We don't have really the resolution to say at this moment. Uh, the little fire icon means it's a high frequency variant. So I mentioned that we had temporal data, and we do. So in this case, uh, the plot that I'm showing you with time series is, um, oh, I guess I cut off the top. I apologize for that. Uh, the um, uh, the ancestral residue was a P, uh, and as you go through time, um, which is on the x-axis, uh, the trend lines show you the frequency within a specific day um, of, or actually, yeah, it was in a specific day that the sequences were collected, of what fraction of these sequences has those residues. And then uh, the histogram is how many sequences were collected that particular day. So you can see that um, L has now become the majority residue and in recent sequences that all were sampling. This also means that if you do a time series analysis and, and say you will, uh, and do statistical test for increasing trend, uh, it will come back as the frequency of the uh, derived residue is increasing. So this is another uh, checkbox. Uh, the next line of evidence goes to um, intra-host variants. So some variants are observed at intermediate frequencies in intra-host samples, which is something that um, Anton Nekrotenko talked about, um, I believe, two weeks ago. And this is used, uh, this is based in the variant calling pipeline um, that's available on our portal from Illumina, and uh, we're expanding it to Oxford Nanopore data, but I don't believe we have any there at the moment. So this particular site has 10 uh, data sets that have the same uh, C to T substitution, genomic position 14,408, median allele frequency 65%, which means that there's evidence, that, and there's a chart there that shows you a little uh, blip at an immediate frequency occurring in this particular um, SRR, uh, short range archive data set. So there's evidence that within host, the same position is being hit by mutation. So it's uh, a different way to look at the fact that this position might be uh, uh, involved in at least inter-host evolution, which is where selection has to start. I have to generate a mutation in a specific variant, a specific uh, um, site in a specific host before it can do anything in the population level. I would like to note, um, and, uh, Anton, as uh, uh, Nekrotenko has done uh, some um, uh, detective work to try to identify uh, which of the data sets you know, may have evidence of really high variability. So for example, we recently uh, uh, um, uh, uh, were made aware that some of the data sets that are deposited in SRA come from low quality uh, degraded RNA data. So they were not meant to uh, be used for inter um, host variant calling. But you can see that some of these data sets basically are um, uh, uh, wildly overrepresented for uh, C2T and G2T substitution. So they show up in all over the genome. And clearly this is not something you expect biologically to happen within a single host. So well, we're filtering these data sets out so they don't come, uh, uh, they don't contribute to our um, evidence. The other thing you can do is you can, uh, uh, one of the great aspects I think of this, uh, um, of the scientific effort um, that, that's uh, targeted towards uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is just uh, that people have been great about sharing their data and computational predictions. So for example, there's this group from UCLA um, that published a preprint uh, where they did a, a multi-method uh, prediction of cytotoxic T cell um, um, epitopes. So which parts of the viral genome might be targeted by uh, the cytotoxic uh, arm of um, the immune system. And one of the canonical ways uh, uh, that immune system uh, exerts pressure on the virus is just through CTL escape. They're nice linear epitopes. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the position um, 323 in RDRP is overlapping. It's covered by an epitope, FPP, TS, F, GPL. Uh, the position that's being mutated is the third position in this epitope. Again, the work on prediction is, was not done by us. We're just using their uh, 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 computer readable files. So I would like to you know, give them a shout out for sharing it and doing an important uh, piece of community work. And it's targeted um, by specific alleles. So not everybody in the human population is going to recognize this. A specific allele that's being, uh, that targets this is HLA-B07.60. You can go to another database where the distribution of this allele in different populations is shown. So you can see, for example, the frequency of this allele is fairly low in Asia. But it's it's sort of uh, you know between 10 and 20 percent in um, sort of northern Europe and the UK. So you can um, 
try to uh, you know, uh, uh, continue um, exploring this and see if there's any evidence that you might have uh, uh, immune, so, uh, immune selection operating on viruses. I think it's too early to tell, but that's something where we can go uh, next. You can also look at the evolution in different uh, viruses and different closely related coronaviruses. So this is a tree of, of bat and pangolin and other viruses, and the black sequence there is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so in this particular case, we can say that this site is, new, is negatively selected uh, in um, uh, uh, other beta coronaviruses, so the fact that it's positive it appears to be, excuse me, positively selected in SARS-CoV-2 could be an indication of something new happening. And we also can uh, uh, leverage the fact that uh, previous uh, um, uh, uh, that other beta coronaviruses have generated specific amino acids there, and try to predict which amino acids are likely or unlikely to occur in SARS-CoV-2. In this particular case, uh, F is something we would not have predicted to occur at this residue. So the, uh, the, common escape, the common variant, which is L, is not unusual, which means we've seen it in beta coronaviruses, but F has never been seen or nothing like it has been seen. So we use actually a statistical imputation method to do this. So this is also an un unusual residue. So to summarize this, um, uh, the point scheme allows you to um, uh, uh, categorize sites into more or less interesting, but at this point, there's no compelling reason to argue that any particular residue, including the one that I just talked to, uh, to you about, is of functional importance. However, like in a lot of uh, genotypic, uh, genotype to phenotype type of analysis, we can identify sets of genomic positions where multiple lines of evidence suggest that evolution may be non-neutral. Um, there's, um, I'm just going to briefly go through um, a couple of slides that summarize everything that's been there. So uh, there's another uh, work, uh, there's another notebook that you can uh, go to to view, view the summary uh, uh, types of tables. So spike protein, which is highlighted, you know, has 15,000 sequences, you know, among 12,700, 1,273 codon positions. You can see how many are variable, how many have amino acid variants selected, and so on. One of the things I would like to note is that spike is not remarkable if you scale it by the length of the genome. Uh, it's actually per kilobase, it has fewer selected sites than many other uh, genomes. And in fact, um, one of the um, expectations that you would see if there's nothing particularly interesting happening in a particular gene, then the number of sites with variants of any kind should be roughly proportional to the length of the gene, right? Because, you know, if a randomly generated or uh, variants um, are observed, then um, you know the longer the gene, the more variants you should see. So, and in fact, this is broadly what we see, regardless of what we count. So, the, the number of variable sites, the number of sites that are, have amino acid variants, positively selected, negatively selected, they're all roughly linear uh, as, as a function of uh, gene length. So, again, this indicates that most of the signal that we see is either neutral uh, uh, or or noise. Um, I'm going to skip this just to say that there's also no evidence that uh, uh, HLA-mediated selection is driving variation. Uh, another way to look at this is uh, whether or not there's stronger or weaker selection if you aggregate variants by position. So in this case, uh, the variant frequency is simply, uh, you know, how many times a particular variant was seen, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then binned. Um, and then on the y-axis is the strength of selection. Um, here it's um, a slightly different measure. So zero is neutral, uh, below zero is negatively selected, and above zero is positively selected. And if um, so, you can basically see that uh, variants that are um, uh, occur that occur once are weakly selected against, which means they're basically neutral, which means they're probably uh, sequencing errors or neutral uh, um, uh, dead end variation. And then as you increase the frequency, they become more and more selected. Uh, and, and against, so purified. And then uh, 21, sort of the next to the most frequent bin intermediate range, 21 to 3,000 variants are the strongest uh, conservation. And then if you go to these couple of variants that are very, very frequent, you actually have positive selection there, right? So uh, in summary, there are about 10 interesting genomic positions. They mostly occur in non-structural proteins in OR38. Um, so not, no evidence in spike. Uh, which is, again, something that people are interested in because it's um, a, a surface protein that's interacting with uh, cell receptors and might be targeted by the immune system. It's immunogenic. Most of these variants have been consistently identified since March. 
which is when we started the, these analyses in our pipeline, uh, is public, generates machine-readable uh, results, comes with visualization tools, and is run in all public and semi-public, uh, just say data regularly. Uh, the pipeline um, at a very high level has the following steps. Um, and again, details are uh, elsewhere. So we currently don't have it released in Galaxy. We're working to do it very, very soon. We have most of the tools in there. We're just testing. Uh, so step zero, get just eight sequence and metadata, perform QC and do code unaware mapping into the reference genome, split it into uh, ORFs and genes. The reason for it is because selection typically operates in protein units. So that's what typically people do when they, people typically do when they look for selection, they look at individual genes or proteins. Uh, then we collapse all of this into unique sequences. This actually helps us with data analysis because I uh, say among 30,000 uh, sequences of or 3 a they're probably only about 300 unique sequences. The reason for it is comparative methods can only use unique sequences. Frequency information isn't utilized uh, in, in DNDS methods, at least anyway. Then we build a crude tree, start out using maximum likelihood, uh, using RaxML, it's just too slow. Uh, uh, there was a, um, uh, uh, a GitHub page that that, that I found um, where um, I, sorry I forget the name of the uh, person that did it, uh, but the um, that actually demonstrated that it doesn't make that much of a difference how you build a tree. So we you can use parsimony or even rapid neighbor joining, which runs in a couple of seconds. So this is what we're using now. The trees are crude and unresolved. Uh, this tool is available in Galaxy, by the way. So if it's if you see G next to the tool that's being ported and packaged uh, or wrapped. Uh, then we compute pairwise distances using a uh, tool called TN93. It's also available in Galaxy to compute divergence and diversity, which are the first wavy plots that I showed you. Then we run selection analyses in HiFi, available in Galaxy. The thing that we're still working on is uh, the result collation, which is a Python script. It's currently in progress. And then we visualize the results using uh, a bunch of JavaScript tools like D3, Vegalite, Phyletry, GS, and we have an observable notebook for this, but we're porting it. Um, to uh, visualization module and galaxy in progress. I'll conclude by noticing, um, uh, by just having a word of caution, again, this uh, this is uh, uh, work by Stephen Weaver, is that since we do a daily snapshot of, of GISAID, one of the things that we noticed is um, the fact that the data themselves mutate, not biologically, but um, I, I guess anthropogenically. Um, so um, between March 23rd and May 13th, uh, there were a total of about 25,000 sequences in the database. Uh, 421 of those sequences changed. Uh, and um, uh, the, the way GISAID records their sequence, uh, the, the way they store their sequence data, there's no way that I can find to say that a particular sequence had been edited. So you don't actually know if any particular sequence you're looking at uh, uh, had any changes made to it since original deposition, which means that if you ran analysis uh, in April and ran analysis now, you might actually get potentially different results if something uh, uh, changed. Sequences, uh, six sequences were changed multiple times. 147 sequences actually resulted in general, uh, in different alignment, which is what propagates through the rest of the analyses. And there are about 30 accession IDs that just disappeared. And here are example of, uh, examples of editing that occurred. Some of them are benign, um, or maybe not. So for example, in the first case, a sequence um, that was um, deposited on uh, April 7th, uh, had these nucleotide letters, which on the next uh, the next day were replaced with ends. Um, the second sequence uh, was simply appended uh, five days after submission. Um, the third sequence had a, a nucleotide inserted, um, and uh, the fourth sequence actually just had nucleotides changed. So this brings me to uh, the end of my talk. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge. Um, uh, a number of collaborators uh, from um, many participating uh, institutions. So uh, a lot of the work for this was done by Galaxy folks, most uh, and, and um, folks in my lab, mostly, uh, most notably Stephen Weaver and um, Antonio Kutenko, but everybody else has contributed as well. And there are a large number of organizations that have provided uh, uh, us the platform computational infrastructure and uh, uh, to uh, to perform these analyses.